is your kid's burden take. Find the yoke his hand is on you laying. Light and easy for his sake. Ye that labor and are heavy laden, lean upon your dear Lord's breast. Ye that labor and are heavy laden, come and I will give you rest. The Invitation Song is 692. Thank you, Daniel, for leading us in these beautiful songs this evening. Thank you for the scripture reading and the prayer, Brother Rolf. Indeed, it is a blessing to be here tonight to study the Word of God together and to do all the acts of worship. I heard two young men recently saying that they did not believe in God. They didn't believe in Jesus Christ, one of them said. And I said, well, because you do not believe in something does not mean it is not real. And today, in our land, we have a lot of skepticism and unbelief. <clears throat> so tonight I want to deal with this question, actually two questions. Does something have to exist in a person's mind for it to be real? And also... Does the fact that man believes something strongly mean that it is real? The first question or the first thought I want to present to us is a philosophy known as solipsism, coming from the Latin word solus, which means alone, like solo, solipsis. It is a philosophy which holds that knowledge of anything outside one's mind is unsure. The external world and other minds cannot be known and might not exist outside the mind. An example of solipsism is the idea that nothing matters except yourself. It is the theory that the self can be aware of nothing but its own experiences and states. The theory that nothing exists or is real but the self. Solipsism. Well, while many would not go that far, they would say, well, because I don't believe in something, it is not real. They doubt the existence of things that they cannot see, especially in the realm of religion. But like other philosophies that are against God and His Word is nothing new. In the 10th Psalm, the psalmist declares in Psalm 10 and 4, the wicked through the pride of his countenance will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. There are many people today who do not want God in their thoughts. They do not want to be responsible to God. They want to live and to do as they please. Before we get to another question, I'd like to ask, do we believe that the universe exists? Now, I don't want to insult our intelligence, but this gets down to it. Does the universe exist? Do we believe that? Yes, we have evidence of the creation. In Psalm 8, we read, in Psalm 8, 1 to 4, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens, out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? We can see the heavens and the earth about us. And we read in the very verse, verse of the Bible, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. 
we have the evidence of creation, although we do not wit we do not witness God's creative act some six thousand years ago, but we see evidence of it all about us. We also see evidence of great design all about us, even in our own body, the human eye, the most intricate of all cameras, and the brain able to store enough information more than the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. One might say, well, I'm not that smart. Well, we're smarter than we think we are. We have the ability and capacity that God has given us. The things all around us, from the tiny insect to the trees to the large animals, to man himself, all evidence, design, and thus a designer. In Romans 1 and 20, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Now we cannot really know the attributes of God, his nature, by looking at the creation, but we can see that there is a God, there is a designer, a creator, by looking at the things about us. There are many things we cannot see, but we have the evidence of them. We cannot see hate, but we witness its harmful and damaging effects all about us, such as the massacre at the Jewish market in New York last week. This was a hate crime, people being biased against Jewish people and many other atrocities throughout history and terrorist acts coming about because of hate. Murder is a work of the flesh, Galatians 5.20, and it results from hatred. And although we cannot see hatred, we see the effects and evidence of it. But on the positive side, we cannot see love. Yet it is one of the most powerful things among people the love of a mother for a child, the love of God, the love for God, and the love for the lost, and many other examples of love. What would motivate a person to leave their home and their family, their native land, and the comforts of this country to go into a third world country and to live far below their standard of living that they've grown up in? It's the love of the lost, the love for the Lord and the gospel. In Mark chapter 10, beginning at verse 29, Jesus said to his disciples, Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that hath left house, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my sake and the gospels. But he shall receive an hundredfold now in this time, houses and brethren, and sisters, and mothers and children and lands with persecution in the world to come eternal life. But many that are first shall be last and the last first. One can even see people in this country leave a job with good livelihood to become a preacher of the gospel and to enjoy much less material things of this world. Out of love for God, for Christ, the church, the Bible, and the soul and desire the spread of the gospel. These are just a few examples of what love can do. Love is a great motivator. We cannot see love, but we can see the effects and the evidence of it. But now the question, does the fact that man believes something strongly mean that it is real? What we believe strongly may be real because we have an ev evidence of it. For example, the things of the Bible we know are real because God's Word declares it to us. And hence we have faith and belief in these things. And faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. But there are many examples in history of things that people believe that are not true and not real, but they believe them just the same as if they were real. In 1492, and we know this sort of rhyme, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. And there were many people who thought that he was just going to go off the edge of the earth because they believed the earth was flat. In 
of course, had they read the Bible in Isaiah 40:22, which speaks of the circle of the earth, they would have known that the earth is spherical in shape and not flat. But then a more serious example goes back to the patriarchal age with Jacob. Jacob was a godly man. His name was changed to Israel. He was the son of Isaac, the grandson of Abraham. And he had several of these sons, but one of them he favored above the others. And his name was Joseph. And of course, the youngest was Benjamin. No doubt he loved him greatly too. Well, these older brothers were envious of Joseph. And they had schemed to put him to death, but decided to spare his life and put him in a pit. And he ended up getting down into Egypt as a slave and then falsely accused, was cast into prison, and then by the providential land of God, rose up the governor. But these brothers went back to their father Jacob after the incident of losing him, uh, after putting him in the pit, and left the impression intentionally that Joseph had been slain by a wild animal. In Genesis 37, beginning at verse 31, and they took Joseph's coat, that is the coat of many colors, as you'll recall, and killed a kid of the goats and dipped it, dipped the coat in the blood. And they sent the coat of many colors, and they brought it to their father and said, This have we found. Now Know now whether it be thy son's coat or no. And he knew it and said, It is my son's coat. An evil beast hath devoured him. Joseph is without doubt rent in pieces. And Jacob rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his loins and mourned for his son many days. And all his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. And he said, For I will go down into the grave unto my son mourning. Thus his father wept for him. For several years, Jacob wept for Joseph as if Joseph were really dead. In fact, he would not have mourned more for him had he been truly dead because Jacob really believed with all his heart that his son Joseph had been killed by a wild beast. Yet several years later we read in Genesis 45, beginning at verse 25, and they went up out of Egypt and came into the land of Canaan of Jacob their father and told him, saying, Joseph is yet alive, and he is governor over all the land of Egypt. And Jacob's heart fainted, for he believed them not. And they told him all the words of Joseph, which he had said unto them. And when he saw the wagons which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob their father revived. And Israel said, that is Jacob, it is enough. Joseph, my son, is yet alive. I will go and see him before I die. Oh, what great news this must have been to Jacob in his old age to learn that the son that he had grieved for for many years was yet alive. And, of course, he went down to Egypt to see him. But he strongly believed that Joseph was dead, but he wasn't. <coughs> Several years ago here in the state of Tennessee, a family in the Lord's Church in Nashville, Tennessee, the family of Pat Boone, of course, of Hollywood fame, that we'd heard of, heard, we've heard of and known for many years, adopted the ideals of the neo-Pentecostal movement and modern-day healing. They brought a lady who was very ill, in fact, fatally ill, to the parents of Pat Boone's house. And hands were laid upon her. And the Boone family, including Pat himself, truly believed that this woman was healed of her serious disease. They truly believed it. But yet it wasn't very long till this woman died. She died of that disease. Sadly, Pat Boone and I assume his family continued in this false movement in believing in modern-day miracles. 
and of course were marked by the church as being unfaithful. The Boones really believed this woman was healed, but she wasn't. And so we can believe something, and there are other examples in the so-called faith healing movement like this, where people went to a modern-day so-called healer thinking they'd been healed, only to die a short time later. We have in the New Testament a great example of a man who was a very intelligent, educated man and a leader among the Jews, Saul of Tarsus. He earnestly believed that Jesus Christ was an imposter and that the church, the followers of Jesus, were to be opposed. After he became a Christian later, he said, I verily thought that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, that is, in opposition to Jesus Christ, according to Acts 26, verse 9. He sincerely believed that he was doing God's bidding by opposing Jesus Christ and the church and the early disciples. He was on the way to Damascus to persecute the disciples. And the Lord appeared to him, and he said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the priests. And Saul said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. And the Lord told him to rise and go into the city, that is, Damascus, and it will be told him what he must do. And there we learn that he, in order to have his sins washed away, was baptized, according to Acts 22, 16, and Acts 9, verse 18. This man had his mind changed regarding Jesus Christ. He saw the evidence and he accepted it, which many people will not do. He was converted to Christ and finally died for the Lord. He said regarding the gospel, for the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. 2 Timothy 1.12 and before his death, he declared in the fourth chapter, I am now ready to be offered in the time of my departure as an I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me that day, and not to me only, but unto all of them also that love his appearing. The gospel of Christ will change people's hearts and minds if people will be honest and sincere, if they will let the Word of God do its work, their minds and hearts can be changed, and that's what repentance is. We note that Paul, who had a great pedigree as a Jew, counted all those things but loss for Christ when he came to know the Lord and to believe on Him. Philippians 3, verse 7 and 8, But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. Philippians 3, verse 7 and 8. People's minds today can be changed by the gospel. And hence Jesus said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That is the gospel of Christ, which is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. To the Jew first, and also the Greek. Romans 1, verse 16. Many years ago, and probably most or maybe all of us are familiar with the movie Harvey, an old black and white movie, in which James Stewart was the star of the movie. He played the role of Elwood P. Dowd, who firmly believed that he had a constant companion by him at all times, a six foot three rabbit or Puka, as he was called, by the name of Harvey. And it was a very humorous movie where everywhere Elwood P. Dowd went, he would take Harvey with him and talk to him as if he were really there. He would open the door for him. He would let him go in front of him. He would offer him a seat. He would introduce him to his friends because he believed in this six-foot-three rabbit. But, of course, it was a figment of the imagination. But on the serious side, man's heart can truly be deceived. 
It can truly believe, be deceived in believing things that are not true and that are not real. Paul warned the Corinthians, let no man deceive himself. 1 Corinthians 3.18 In Jeremiah 17.9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. There are some who doubt that Satan is real. Like the man who said, well, I've never bumped into him, scoffing at the idea of the devil. Well, you turn around and do right, and you will bump into the devil. It's true, isn't it? We start to do right, the devil is going to oppose us. 1 Peter 5, 8, Peter declares the reality of Satan. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. But now the other question we want to deal with, does man have to believe in something for it to be real? Many today do not believe in God, yet he is real. We are told that atheism is on the rise in this country. But in Psalm 14.1 and Psalm 53.1, it's repeated, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. The fact that many people do no longer believe in him, does that mean that he no longer exists or never did exist? Absolutely not. God is real. And one day we will stand before God. Do we have to see something for it to be real? If you have your Bible, would you turn with me to Hebrews, the 11th chapter? This is regarding Moses in verse 26 and 27. We read of Moses esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect and the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, that is the Pharaoh, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Now how can we see one who is invisible? Surely it's not talking about Pharaoh. It's talking about God. He did not fear the wrath of the king, Pharaoh, a very powerful ruler, because of his great faith and reverence for God Almighty. He could see him who is invisible according to verse 27. How could he do this? Through the eye of faith. He did not literally see God, but this is a powerful way of expressing the fact that Moses knew of a surety that God is real. In the sixth verse of Hebrews 11, But without faith it is impossible to please Him, for he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Now, I'd like to go to the 20th chapter of the book of John. This was the chapter in which the Lord, after His resurrection, appeared unto his disciples on the Lord's Day evening. But at this first appearance to them, Thomas was not present. They told Thomas of the appearance of the Lord, but he did not believe it. He said to them, Except I shall see in his hands a print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. That's verse 25. Let's put it this way, at least he had a strong doubt as to whether they really saw the Lord or not. But then eight days later, Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. He believed. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Well, everyone who truly believes on the Lord today is in that category because we have not seen the Lord in his earthly form. And we shall not see him in that form. <coughs> One day we shall see him when he appears in the second coming. Every eye will see him. Revelation 1 verse 7. But not until that time. God 
does not <clears throat> expect us to believe something for which we have no proof or evidence. In fact, he does not want us to do so. But yet, when it comes to the faith of the gospel, we have proof. When it comes to the Messiahship and the deity of Jesus, we have proof. In the next two verses here, John 20, 30, 31, truly many other signs did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that believe that believing you might have life through his name. We must believe that, or we cannot have life in his name. In Hebrews 11 and verse 1, Now faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. As we have cited earlier from Romans 1.20, in Genesis chapter 1, in Psalm 8, we have evidence of God in the creation. Psalm 19.1 also, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth His handiwork. Go back to the beginning of the book of Luke. What a great beginning this is. In chapter 1 of Luke, in the first four verses. An affirmation of the surety of the gospel that has been brought to man. As Luke writes to Theophilus, For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they deliver them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. The certainty of those things. But my friends, there are many people who doubt. They doubt the Lord's second coming. They doubt the day of the Lord. I'd like to turn to Second Peter chapter 3, beginning at verse number 1. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days, that's the Christian age, the last age of man which we're now living in, there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Because he has not come already. They reason, well, he's not going to come back. But verse 10 says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with great noise, and the element shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also and the works that are therein <coughs> shall be burned up. Many people doubt heaven and hell. Of course, there are a lot of people, more people want to believe in heaven than they do hell. But you can't believe in one without the other because the Bible teaches both. I'd like to go here briefly to the book of Revelation, chapter 21. And in this chapter, and of course in chapter 22 also, heaven is described. And in verse number 5, this is what John said concerning the Lord who sat upon the throne. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. These words are true and faithful that have been given to you about heaven. But then verse 8 talks about hell. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is a second death. Those words are true and faithful also. What God tells us about heaven and hell is true. And yes, we better believe that. As we close this evening, the mind may be deceived. The heart may be blinded by Satan. 
But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. And whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them, 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4. Remember the parable of the sower, that the devil came and snatched the word out of their hearts. Man may believe a lie and will if he rejects the truth. There's only one, one of two choices. Either we believe the truth, receive the love of the truth, and accept it, or we believe a lie. There is no other alternative but these. So I'd like to, as we close, turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And of course, Brother Ralph read from verse 8 to 12. I would like to read verse 11 and 12, or 10 to 12. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness and them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Friends, God wants us to receive the love of the truth. The truth is that which makes us free, John 8, 32. The truth is the word of God, John 17, verse 17. God would have all men to be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth, 1 Timothy 2, 4. But many will not do that because they refuse to believe it, accept it, and obey it. But he goes on to say, verse 11 and 12, And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie. The idea is not that God tempts man to do evil and believe a lie, but God allows them to do so, because they have rejected His truth. That they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now I ask you tonight, does that not describe many people in our age? They reject the truth. They refuse to believe it. They believe it not because they have pleasure in unrighteousness. That's the reason. But tonight, aren't we thankful that we can believe, that we can know the truth, that we can obey, it, that we can be saved from sin and one day be saved eternally in heaven? This evening we have this promise in the Scripture that if we come to Him in faith, He will receive us. But if we do not come to Him in faith, He will not. If we reject His Word, He will reject us. John 12, 48. If we have any who need to come and believe and obey the Gospel, we encourage you to do that. Upon hearing God's Word to believe, Romans 10, 17, Come to repentance, lest we perish, 2 Peter 3, 9, Luke 13, 3. To confess Jesus Christ, the Son of God, that we believe in Him with all of our hearts, as did the Ethiopian nobleman in Acts 8, 37. And then to be baptized in His name for the remission of sins, Acts 2, 38. Have we done that, but we have allowed to arise within us an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God, Hebrews 3, 12. And this evening we need to return to Him. In repentance, confession, and prayer that we might be forgiven in Acts 8, 22 to 24. We encourage and invite you, my friend, while we stand together and we sing. <clears throat>